I'm Mark Sine, Minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and I'd like to welcome you to our evening services for uh, Sunday, uh, February the 20th. We'll be singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, and I'll give you the name of the song. So perhaps if you don't have the book and you have your device, you can Google it real quickly and sing along with us. And so if you would please turn your song books first to number 417, 417. The name of the song is Where He Leads I'll Follow, 417. Let's sing verses one and three, one and three. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is in pattern for me. Where he leads I'll follow. Follow all the way Where he leads I'll follow Follow Jesus every day List to his loving words Come unto me Weary, heavy, laden There is sweet rest for thee Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior and thy soul is secure. Where he leads a follow, follow all the way. Where he leads a follow. Follow Jesus every day. And if you would turn to number four. Number four. And the title of this song is To God Be the Glory. To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his song. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let, let the, the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. O fix redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offenders who truly obey, that moment may enter the heavenly way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. 
All come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Number 763. This will be the song before the Lord's Supper. Let's sing verses 1 and 3. 1 and 3. Oh, Master, let me walk with Thee In lowly paths of service free Tell me the secret, tell me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care, in hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's running way in peace that only thou canst give with thee O Master let me live we are instructed on the first day of the week uh, to come together uh, this is the Lord's day. Uh, this is Sunday. This is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And so we call it the first day of the week. And one of the things that we do when we gather together in worship is we break bread together according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in his last night with his, uh, his disciples. And uh, when he did that, uh, he broke bread and he let them know uh, that this would represent his body. And then he took a cup and said it would represent his blood. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul encapsulates that uh, just about the same way that Jesus did it on that fateful night. And so as we gather about the Lord's table, let's think of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ the body which he gave up for us, the blood which is the substitute uh, for our sins and is what will wash away our sins. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to give up his body, uh, that we might live. We're so grateful for that great plan that you had from the very beginning and that Jesus was uh, willing to do what he did and was the path for us to grace and mercy and the possibility of eternal life with you. Help us as we partake of this bread to remember what Jesus did in giving his body up for us. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And for the cup. We're so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood, uh, that blood that uh, spilled from his body. He let us know is all about our redemption, is all about our forgiveness of sins. 
Help us to understand that that blood does indeed wash our sins away. And it's only through having our sins washed away through our repentance that we can approach your th throne of mercy. Bless us as we partake, we pray it in his most holy name. Amen. And at this time, as a matter of convenience, we know on the first day of the week that um, uh, the Apostle Paul told uh, us that uh, we are to give back, that we are to give of what we have been prospered. What we are told is that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. We're told to give because uh, Jesus gave to us. We are told to give because it is part of our duty. And so let's remember some of the classic examples of giving, the widow giving of those two copper coins. And uh, in uh, Paul talking about the Macedonians, that before they gave of their means, even though they gave from their want, that they first gave of themselves. Let's pray for the giving. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we have the opportunity to give. Hope us to give with an open mind. Hope us to give with an open heart. Hope us to give with an uh, open pocket. Bless us and bless those that take care of these funds, that they may be used for benevolence and evangelism, that they may be used so that this church can continue its mission here on earth. Uh, we ask that you would bless us in our giving. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. And the last song that we'll sing is number 719. 719. The title is Love One Another. 719, Love One Another. Angry words, so oh, let them never from my tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lip. Love one and love each other. Love each other. The Father's blessed command. Love one and love each other. Love each other. Children obey the blessed command. Love is much too pure and holy. Friendship is. To sacred far, for a moment's reckless folly, lost to desolate and mar. Love one another, love each other, love each other. Tis the Father's blessed command. Love each other, love each other, tis the blessed command. Let our words be sweetly spoken, let kind thoughts be greatly stirred. Show our love to one another with abundance of kind words. Love one another, love each other, love each other. Tis the Father's blessed command. Love one another, love each other, love each other, tis the finest command. I hope all of you.
you sang along with us and I know the Lord was praised in the song. Uh, he is worthy of our praise and uh, it's good that we are able to do that. If you were there this morning, you uh, heard the title of my lesson and uh, if it sounded intriguing, that's great. Uh, the title is Consequences Can't Be Avoided Forever. Consequences Can't Be Avoided Forever. Um, in the late 40s, I don't remember that part, even though I was alive, uh, on radio, there was a show that was called Truth or Consequences. Any of you that are in the 60s genre, uh, into the 70s genre, know that it made its way onto television. And one of the hosts was our one of our favorite guys, Bob Barker. And uh, the show was called Truth or Consequences. Two uh, contestants came on and they were asked a totally silly, idiotic question, a very trivial question that very, very rarely any of them answered correctly. They were given two seconds to get the answer and then <clears throat> what was called Beulah's Bell went off and uh, then they had to do some silly, zany stunt. Um, People liked the show. Uh, it remained on until into the 70s and then actually went into syndication. Truth or consequences? I brought that up because uh, it is in my lesson this evening. If you turn to the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6, down to verse 21. Okay, the New American Standard reads it this way. Uh, Romans 6, 21 to 22. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of these things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive the benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. In another version, it reads this way. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. You know what, our, our, our lives are a series of steps, aren't they? It's one step after another step. I think it's why uh, we call it our Christian walk. It is it is just, it goes on from the moment we wake up in the morning until we put our heads on the pillow and go to sleep in the evening. One step after another. And here's the interesting thing. Uh, if we put it in layman's terms, every path that we take leads to somewhere. And every action in which we engage Indeed, every thought that we think takes us one further step down the road. And it leads to some destination. Now, we can think of it in terms of travel on our own. When we decide to go somewhere, uh, we go somewhere with a destination in mind. And that destination, uh, maybe it takes a half hour, maybe it takes an hour, two hours. Maybe the destination is is the, <laughs> the shop rate for us to go shopping. If that is so, that's the destination. Now, in Romans chapter six, Paul began the verse in verse 21 to the godless ways 
that the Christians he was talking to were before they came became Christians, before their conversion to Jesus Christ. And he asked them, now in in the NAS version, it says, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? Or it says, what fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? All right. What was the fruit? Interestingly enough, as we uh, go on our Christian walk, and again, there is a destination. We find out that all of our actions, both the godly ones and the ungodly ones, bear some kind of fruit. Now, in the first verse here, it says, in the case of ungodlessness, the fruit is deadly. And so he told those Christians, that path that you went down, that ungodly path, you, when you became a Christian, became ashamed of, All right? Paul wrote that the fate there is death. Now, death is not just the arbitrary punishment of God for evil doing. It's the inevitable result or consequence of it. Now, for all human beings, from a physical standpoint, death is the end of our physical road, our physical walk here on earth. Now, when we talk about spiritual death, if a person travels that way that he shouldn't travel, death is more than that. If he refuses to change, death is the only place he can get to. It's the only place it's where the road leads, leads, no matter who the traveler is. It does not matter. Now with that, we understand that God gave us free will. He gave us the right of choice. And choice always entails consequences. And so since we have this free will, we are able to make our choices. Now, what God has chosen to do is he's chosen to give us a guidebook. This guidebook helps us to make the right choices. Now, Regardless of whether we make the right choices or the wrong choices, consequences are unalterably attached to the choices. We can't have the former without the latter. All right. We can't have what we do unattached to what the consequences might be. We may, it's true, be able to avoid the consequences for a period of time, especially here on the earth in our physical bodies. But we can't do so forever. You know, as workers, we all look forward to payday. And for everybody that walks the earth, there is a payday. And when it comes we need not be surprised. Jesus told his disciples that he was coming back and that no one, not even himself, knew the exact time when he would do that. And when he came back, he would judge the earth. And the judgment would be based on how people lead their lives. It is then 
when real consequences take place. Now, it's an immutable principle, and it's dotted through the Old Testament. It's reiterated in the New Testament. If we look in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, that says, Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If we think otherwise, we mock God. This is a godly principle. We know from the parable, the, the wheat and the tares, that the farmer planted wheat and an enemy came in and planted these weeds. And there was a difference between the weeds, the tares, and the wheat. And so understand when the believer separates the sowing and reaping principle, God is mocked in this. And it's not just eternity. Now, that's the big prize, isn't it? That's what, that's what each of us is striving toward. Each of us is striving toward living godly lives so our destination will be eternity with God. But interestingly enough, even here on earth, as we walk, all of our actions, all of our deeds have consequences attached to them. And these very often come down before Judgment Day, all right? Paul spoke of those who, while still living, received the penalty of their error, which was due. If we go back to Romans chapter 1 and verse 27, and it says, In the same way also the men abandoned their natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, and men with men committing indecent acts and receiving their own persons due penalty of their error. This is one specific instance. Any sin, any grievous sin that we do, that we do it in such a callous way that we refuse to think of what the results might be. If we don't repent of that action, there will be consequences. And he, and Paul spoke of that. You see, Jesus described all of this as a banquet being prepared for us. Right? The eternity is a banquet that's being prepared. And we have to do all the things necessary to attend that banquet. And we will have no choice but to eat it when it's set before us. You know, we, <laughs> it's an old term, we can run, but we can't hide. Back in the 40s, uh, there was a heavyweight champion of the world whose name was Joe Lewis. Uh, he defended his heavyweight title some 25 times over the space of seven or eight years. He faced a light heavyweight named Billy Kahn. Now, if you know anything about boxing, a light heavyweight can be 175 pounds. Anything over that can be considered what is the heavyweight. That's the kind of the crown jewel of boxing. Well, Billy Kahn was a boxer who uh, danced around the ring. He would just throw pitter-patter punches, and he danced around the ring trying to keep from being hit. And for some 12 rounds, he did that with Joe Lewis. And on all the scorecards, he was ahead. But he got kind of cocky. And uh, he decided he was so successful in this that he could punch it out with the greatest puncher, perhaps, of the day. 
and he lost. He got knocked out. Joe Lewis's words before the fight were prophetic because he knew the kind of fighter Billy Kahn was. He said he can run, but he can't hide. Everybody you know, in boxing, it says, is okay until they get punched. And then the inevitable happens. In our Bibles, Adam and Eve tried to hide from God after they ate of the tree that they were not supposed to eat of. Cain uh, told God after he had killed his brother and God uh, asked him about it even though he knew what was going on. And Cain's uh, answer that said, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, he was trying to hide too. For years and years and years, people have done things wrong and decided that they can hide those things from God. But the inevitability is this, wrong is wrong. You know, children have to learn this lesson. If a child does something wrong and gets away with it, they can't believe that it's okay. See, they see it's okay because they've gotten away with it. But there are consequences. And so this is called the law of cause and effect. And it is no respecter of persons. It will catch up to everybody sooner or later. There are always consequences. And so we need to remember this. Consequences both in this life itself and the whole picture of life and then the life after death are dependent upon the way that we walk. And Paul said it to those people that weren't Christians. When you were walking before you were Christians, you should have been ashamed of the things that you were doing. And if you did not come to the Lord, you would suffer the consequences. And by the same token, he said, when you become a Christian and you take Jesus into your lives, you also receive the consequences. These are great consequences. These are the consequences of doing things that please God and serve others. This is what we need to strive for. These are the consequences, the positive ones that will last through to eternity. And so let's look at the delineation between those two verses in Romans chapter 6, verse 21 and 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves to God, you have your fruit to holiness and in the end, everlasting life. When we come to the Lord, everlasting life is the benefit we have. Uh, you know, it, it it's a little more difficult to call it a consequence. It, it kind of changes, it morphs into a benefit. The consequence is a good one. And so if you haven't come to the Lord, you know that you have things in your life that you're ashamed of and you need to rectify those. And so this evening, if you need to come to the Lord, if you need to start your Christian walk to get to your destination, because all of us have a destination, we ask that you come to the Lord. We ask that you confess him as the Son of God, repent of your former ways, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you are subject to that invitation, we invite you this evening. We will be there. We will help you in any way possible so that you can see your way through to accepting Jesus and obeying his plan of salvation. If you need to come, uh, this is the time. Get in touch with us. I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to all of us. Uh, let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful that we have you in our lives. 
We know, dear Heavenly Father, that we can't hide our sins. And we know that in our Christian walk, uh, we all have a destination. All of us will die a physical death. And uh, that's inevitable for everyone. But it is that eternal life that we strive toward. Help us to do everything we can to live by your word so that uh, uh, our consequence will turn into a benefit, that we will live with you eternally because we have accepted your Son as our Savior. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, on our Christian walk. Help us to say and do the things that we ought to so that you will be pleased because we want so much to have that wonderful relationship with you in which we are being your servants. Bless us, be with us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all.